you can only suddenly allow yourself to be touched by a grace that is beyond logic and beyond reason. And, and then it flowers in you as music, with the product of wind through a flute. It flowers in you. And then along with that flowering comes something called an active caring, compassion. You know, do compassion. That's something quite different, the performance of compassion, as, as well intended as it may be, as sincere as it may be. Um, it's, it is something very, compassion is a non-dual, uh, it is the first gift. Welcome to the Mind Tracks podcast with breakthrough ideas to live your best life possible and how to make it happen. I'm Paul Sheely, and today we will be talking with Barnett Bain. Barnett Bain is a filmmaker, author, and executive coach with a long history of spiritually oriented filmmaking. His film credits include Milton's Secret, What Dreams May Come, Homeless to Harvard, The Celestine Prophecy, and The Lost and Found Family. His books include The Book of Doing and Being, Rediscovering Creativity in Life, Love, and Work, and The Third Story, Awakening the Love that Transforms. Barnett coaches business leaders and private clients who are committed to expanding awareness. Barnett, so good to be with you, my friend. Thanks for joining this podcast. Oh, what a pleasure. It's nice to see you, and hello to all our listeners. Yes, and- well, you know, you had me on your podcast, and now Turnabout is fair play, right? That's what they say. So, well, okay. here's the here's the thing that I have always loved about you. Whenever we get together, it's an emergent moment, kind of like... Uh, you know, a good unfolding improv theater. And uh, you're creative to the max. I love that about you. And you've written a bunch about creativity. I like to say your book of doing. The book of doing. doing. <laughs> the book of doing. Doing and bing. <laughs> doing and bing. So so what I, I've often talked about our work out in the world is our doing and our interior work is our being. You absolutely dialed that in with your book. I really loved it. Now, there are a couple of questions I like to ask about creativity in general, and we'll try to get into some nitty gritty of how anyone can up their game in creativity. Talk to me about this: a statement that you wrote, regardless of your age, education, or professional experience, you will be called on to your real work. That call will never cease. You bring creativity to a point of using it to follow our true call. Talk to me about the true call as you see it. So the, thank you for asking that particular question uh, because this is a question that is, um, that is um, front of mind, top of mind for me all day, every day. Whoa. It's not that I have to keep it there and I have to fight. It's, it's really not like that at all. But some time ago, it occurred to me that uh, not only is every act a creative act, every act is a creative act, even uh, the act of saying I have no creative impulse whatsoever is a highly creative act. It's not a productive act, but it is... <laughs> does involve volition and it is a commitment uh, to a worldview. And unfortunately, our life um, falls in behind where we focus. Yeah, it is, in fact, a way of creating that experience at that moment, right? So Absolutely. good. Yeah. The, the key, there is creativity and then there's artfulness. <clears throat> and why I say this is top of mind for me is because I am um, at this point in my life, 
I am more focused on artful living, making of my life a work of art, a, a thing of beauty, uh, than I am um, committed to um, things like purpose, and which, which I, I believe are developmental, They're tied very much to developmental psychology, a, a need to have a purpose-driven life, um, creates a certain kind of order, which is very much antithetical to making a friend of uncertainty. You're either on purpose or you're in love, but no lover has ever been on purpose. Usually this usually disintegrates or deteriorates into agendas, but so to your question, uh, which I've forgotten, <laughs> to, your, to your question, when one is, um, the real work of one's the life. Real work when one is is uh, begins to uh, let in that only creativity exists. There is nothing else going on. There is only creative acts. As I said, that is very different than productive acts. There is only creation going on. What uh, when 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 I sat with that for a while, what bubbled up uh, behind it eventually is uh, what's for now? To what, what end are you saying? To what end? Or? What end? What for? Okay. To what end for? For um, what purpose? Which is a feedback loop. Once you get into the feedback loop, it occurs to me. Oh, I am now in a on a psychological hamster wheel. I like it, yeah. What is, what is there beyond that? What is there that can that uh, supersedes that, that holds that? Holds First, that, yeah. The galaxy that holds that little solar system round and round and round and round. Ah, yep. that's the yep. real work. Okay, so. Becoming I, intimate, uh, becoming open, Becoming aware of my uh, pa psychological patterns, if then the cause effect reality of a certain kind of con psychological conditioning, which is a closed loop of creation and recreation more accurately, rearranging the furniture. Sometimes uh, in, in pursuit of great enterprises, this is not in any way a, a judgment, a value judgment, not about that. So there is um, wonder and, and gifts in that. And there is also um, the um, desire to foster and cultivate and uh, give and receive from a relationship beyond logic and reason without losing logic and reason. I don't want to become... I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. So... That couple, is great work. A couple of things, right? It, that is living an artistic life. So just like doing is out in the world and being is its polarity, like a breath, you exhale out into the world, you inhale to recover. Exhaling is wonderful, but it's not sustainable. That's right. Inhaling is delightful, but it's not sustainable. So exactly. you could could we place art and purpose on the same infinity symbol. So your art is what you do in the creative act in the world, but it cannot live, cannot be yeah, without no, a deeper purpose yeah, you know, that, that lifts it. I haven't had, I've never heard it put that, that way and uh, it's delightful. So I'm, I'm um, buzzing at it. Tingly. Uh, I'm tingly, which is the first sign to me it's the first sign. So, uh, absolutely, there is art is a doing is an expressive act uh, act of will. The inhale um, that is not art. That is not an act of will. You're you don't you don't need to participate in, in that. There are forces that are breathing you. Thank you. So uh, that is an act of. That is an act of, of, at best, of wonder and willingness.
very different energies, will and willingness, very different. Mm, mm, mm. And so the um, where they come together, uh, I believe where they come together is, um, again, in this kind of superseding um, relationship, relationship with a sort of superseding uh, being state which in some traditions is referred to as non-dual. I don't want to get all jargony. I get all tingly with that one. That's that's my happy spot. But we'll, to that point, and I do want to hold that as a possible container for what we're talking about. It's, it's the only container <laughs> there is anyway. Right? So there is a container that would be called the possibility of our lives. And you wrote a book called The Third Story. And I think that third story comes from that, which is a third space, which is an emergent space. It's a place where there, it's logical, it's emotional, and it's more than either of those. It's a both and, but it's not even this or that, it's not even both and, it's something else. It's a, it's something else that is, I believe, to what point we started with, that's the place where our calling shows up from. It shows up from that place. Yes, that is the and, origin place. It's right. Like if we origin mystery. Well, as my meditation teacher would often refer to this space as um, the place where the universe as we know it has withdrawn into itself. It's that place from which all creativity is born. It is, it's beyond thought. It's either a great fullness, as they say in the Himalayan tradition, or a great well, emptiness, as they talk about in the Taoist tradition, right? Either one works, both work, and uh, it's not necessarily very in, uh, easy to introduce that to someone if they're living in their doing, if they're living in their attempt to be on purpose. So there was a lovely story you told in Doing and Being about doing a consulting job in an oil company in Canada. And the, you know, there's the HR director, he's got his arms folded. People, so they've had a few rough years. <laughs> yes, exactly. So this guy is standing in the back of your classroom, metaphorically, arms folded, thinking, why the heck? Would an oil let's company? Get this guy out of here! <laughs> yeah, let's do something productive, right? Why are we talking about creativity? Now, I had a similar experience, which is why I love the story so much. I was called into a big company here in Minneapolis. You may have heard about it; they make thermostats. But what they were doing is is they were technology rich and application poor, so they needed to become more proactive, more able to bring to market some of their great ideas. I created a course for them on creative problem solving, and it took a rational problem solving approach and a creative problem solving approach and squished them all together in this neat little bundle based on neurolinguistic programming. And it was in their course catalog for years. I loved teaching these folks. And it was always a mind blow for them. You know, they, right. And the same thing happened for this fellow in your course. Would you tell I the story? I want to go for, go to work for you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a turnaround. Right the same guy that said, <laughs> who brought this, this is a waste of time. Now he, he ended up quitting. Yes. He became a life coach. Yes. So, so talk to me about that. You, you talk about creativity as a transformative act. It's a, it's an act of transformation, whether we are transformed by it or we're in 
a transformational process for whatever is coming into the world. That's a developmental shift, if you will. It's a it's a quantum it leap. In at root, I'm not going to make a, a categoric statement like that. It's embarrassing, but we can. Lar there's largely two states, fundamental states. One is a state of will. In that state, we are expressive, as you pointed out before, with the with the metaphor of the breath. We are, we are changing the world in some way. Okay. Not always for the better. Uh, when we attach it to psychological um, uh, drives, uh, then they often become: I want to demolish the world out of my stuff, or I want to improve it out of my stuff. <laughs> Those are drives. We have impact. The other state is I am acted upon. That requires a little more humility to get to the point where you realize I'm, I'm, I'm as, a, um, as wind through a flute. Forces are playing through me. I'm along for the ride and I get to collaborate, co-create. A piece of clay in the potter's hands. Yeah, I have a I have some issue with that because um, what uh, it's it's a metaphor that only takes us so far. It suggests that we are um, inanimate stuff. We're we we're stuff of the stuff. So we're not inanimate stuff. We were never inanimate stuff. Um, it, is, it was always consciousness. We can go right, right way down the rabbit hole now, but you know, not, we were not blown, you know, life into some clay shell. Uh, it um, it it creates. Um, uh, we it, it it we have a legacy of treating ourselves as objects as a culture, and I think it's. Um, I like that distinction. That. Yeah. The root of that is this kind of metaphor that is baked into the Judeo-Christian culture. It's also baked, by the way, into the Hindu culture. Um, you know, the churning of the ocean of milk origin story. It's baked into the Islamic culture, the Garden of Jana paradise. The same. We're nothing. <laughs> but but um, I have a different take on those origin stories that I think you will prefer. All those stories of um, were made from clay, you know, the golem. In all these stories, they allude to an original state of oneness of all things. They all allude to it. Gardens of Eden. And then the humans um, uh, either churn the ocean of milk or they drank, they ate of the fruit, the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And then what happened? They gained the capacity for abstract thought. Suddenly, subject, object. And now I go about labeling everything in the garden. Tree, snake, woman, look at me, me, you. Suddenly, the oneness, um, we go from subject ego to, uh, and object to not me, and the oneness is shattered. And this, unfortunately, is the, the worldview that has... Um, this is we have dropped into a, a pretend i'm going to pretend that i am distinct and separate and i am a creation the potter's clay i'm not part of the whole thing i've been created and now i'm going to live i'm going to pretend that that's not just to pretend now i'm lost forever i'm going to pretend and i'm going to pretend it's not just to pretend now we go around the mulberry bush long, long, and now we create time, we create space, a subject object. Now we're busy for a while. Yeah. So um, what is the real work? You like how I brought that back? What Very is much. the real work? The real work is to put on that light. Ding. I am one, there's one thing going on. This subject object game, it's a role. I played that role. I'm still playing that role. I almost exclusively play that role, but there's a glimmer of me that is hanging from the chain. Just pull that light on. 
that is the life's work. And that is the life's work of every human being on the planet, eventually. Eventually, we go through what I refer to as the first story, the second story. Those are psychological states. The first story, what happened to me? Born with a silver spoon, born with a wooden spoon, beaten, walked to school through, you know, on a shovel, through 10 feet of snow, <laughs> had it this way, where you had your kids had it but so easy, all that. Second story, how I got over it. Built the business, uh, married the man, gained the weight, lost the weight, became the president, became the pauper, became the worst person in the world, became the best person in the world. If we're very fortunate and open to the in-breath, we can um, be drawn and allow, to, uh, allow ourselves to be baked in the glory and in the grace of, when I say grace, I mean the, uh, the way eagles, and with the way eagles fly, it comes naturally. There is something in us that comes naturally. It's not no longer, I need to effort it. I, there's me, there's the world. It's a natural thing that is born. And um, and we follow it like a like a hound dog, nose to the trail. We follow it, we follow it, we follow it. We cultivate it, we treasure it, we make it valuable. We prioritize it in our lives. Sounds like a lot of doing, right? There's no doing. It's suddenly the rest, the rest sort of takes a different priority in one's life. Presencing, being present and sensing, right? Yeah, and there's tons and tons of talk now around presence and presence and presence. And what do I have to do to be present? Okay, that's... <laughs> Doing to be. Yeah, how, what do I have to do? Okay, yeah, I want to I want to be. How do I do it? You know, and, and um, it's touching and it's poignant. Uh, that is, to a hammer, uh, you know, everything looks like a nail. The true work, there are more tools in the kit, my friend. Yeah, the, I'm thinking about the bodhisattva vow, which is I will continue in this practice until all suffering has left humanity. And so that's why I resonate with your statement of we'll continue on this until that day when the unification, the oneness, the enlightenment actually occurs. It's very difficult to live inside of a mind and try to understand it. As Carl Jung said, how do we know the dragon that swallowed us, right? When we're inside of our doing, the only way to get to being is to do something to get there. And so the Zen koans are these torturous little ways of holding that space of mind from which something else can emerge. That third story, that third space, whatever that might be, I agree wholeheartedly with you. It's worth pursuing. And I want, I, I interrupt or at least derailed a particular train of thought when you were mentioning the flute in the wind in the flute. Um, so how is us being that wind in the flute different than the stuff of clay being molded by some outside force? The wind and the flute are one thing. They don't, they're not separate. They are, uh, as Bucky okay. Fuller used to talk about, they, you know, this is something, this is a synergy, which when, when Bucky Fuller introduced synergies, a mind blower. What is genius about that genius is that he took uh, he took non dual truth and he said, "Well, let me just put this in a way that people can discover it and come at it this way." You know that specialization. He said, "You know, it's enough of that specialization. Become a generalist." It was always about it's one system. It's one system. The uh, music from a flute, you know, it doesn't um, it doesn't differentiate that uh, there was the flute and there was the wind, the ruach, the spirit. 
it's one thing. I'm sitting here with a lamp on my desk and you know, there's the bulb and the, the bulb participates and there's the wire and there's the armature and there's the little neck and any one piece of it is not diminished or less than any other piece of it, nor is it diminished in any way because together it's a lamp. So but when we um, attempt psychologically to how do I do being, how do I do the music? Well, I have a flute and then I blow through it. And now, you know, it's like, I can't even try to follow instructions how to tie your shoe. Yes. So, you know, it's like trying to, um, to point to the tip of your finger with the tip of your finger. You have to get out of the set. You have to get out of you know the set of all uneven numbers. How do I find a even number inside the set of all even numbers? You won't. You'll be looking for a while. <laughs> and this is the nature of uh, what we um, are psychologically conditioned to. Um, the, this is the bubble in which we're psychologically conditioned to exist and to persist. And what is the true work is not to diminish it, not to pop the bubble, to transcend and include it. And what is a compassionate nature? It, it, it's birthed out of, as, as distinct from sympathy or empathy, it's a birthed out of a certain, a personal, a personal, um, action, act, active caring. It's an active caring that is born out of an experience of personal suffering. Because my life has been, has been uh, almost entirely and now mostly <laughs> lived inside this, psycho this binary psychological state called doing and being, I understand the pain of that. Mm. To live on one side and try to balance and reconcile it is difficult, right? You can't. You it can never happen. You can only right. suddenly. You can only suddenly allow yourself to be touched by a grace that is beyond logic and beyond reason, and and then it flowers in you as music, with the product of wind through a flute. It flowers, nice. in you, and then along with that flowering comes something called an active caring compassion you don't do compassion that's something quite different the performance of compassion as as well intended as it may be as sincere as it may be um it's, it's something very compassion is a non-dual uh, it is the first gift or uh, just sort of like uh you know those what was that was it kilroy with the little hands over the wall on those eyeballs, yeah. That's so, the first gift of a non-dual state. The first gift is compassionate love. The low, the lowest hanging fruit of a non-dual state. Now, I can't speak to anything beyond there because I haven't consciously <laughs> logged anything beyond there. But it's a good starting point. That work. <laughs> if, if we could all live there, that's great. And interesting that the science is recognizing that the most powerful motivator of any one individual's behavior is not self-castigation, not punishing themselves for failing, but compassion, self-compassion. So it's a worthy ideal, no doubt. And I'm That's also- Your point, I, I, it thrills me that you made that distinction that it's self-compassion, mm -hmm. self-compassion. and. Why is it self-compassion? You know, sometimes I hear, you know, I, I, you would say something like that, and I might hear somebody saying, "Oh no, they were so selfish." There's only the self going on. There, what? <laughs> there isn't anything else going on. It's like I've got four fingers up for those of us that are listening but not viewing. And when, uh, when I drop the uh, the screen over the below the four fingers up whoa it's they're all attached 
There is only the self going on. The true work is to um, recalibrate and to discover and to uh, allow and to be worked upon by aspects of the self beyond my uh, very limited uh, senses, to activate the uncommon senses, not just the five common ones. Well, you've led me to a place that I have wanted to go with you. Um, having spent a lot of my professional life in that creativity and problem solving world as consultant and human development specialist, I wrote about in my book, Natural Brilliance, there's a creative problem solving approach people could use. But you introduced in your book of doing and being the idea of calling upon muses. And now I, I want to set a context for this first. You referred to the hero, heroic journey, the hero's journey or shero's journey. There is in the hero's journey, there is the crossing of a threshold. And at the threshold, there's a guardian that stands saying, you shall not pass, right? What is your favorite color? <laughs> What is your name? So, but you know, the idea is that there is a guardian at the threshold that basically wants to send you home if you're not all in. And I've spent a bit of time over the last couple of years helping people recognize that these guardians are really our protector mechanisms. They're saying, hey, just remember all the ways you've screwed up up until now. You're talking about this new way of living your life just to warn you, you know, don't do this. We miss the subtext that says, unless you're all in, but we just feel the fear and run away. Those who are willing to cross a threshold, the good news is there's always helpers on the other side. We couldn't anticipate them ahead of time but they're always there for us. There will be a guide, there will be a helper, there will be a friend along the path that will show up exactly at the time that we need it most. Now you brought in, <clears throat> like I brought in these guardians, these archetypes, you brought into your book, the archetypes of the nine muses. And I loved it. I dug into it a bit more. I like to go to the ancient Greek. I. I was at the Parthenon as a child, and I, you know, it's it's still a glorious idea to me to think about a culture that recognized these divine energies that are always attendant to us. Now, we're not going to go through Cleo and uh, and Arato, and that was a good one. I, they're all great. All the muses are great. And I do want to say, hey, read the book, think about the muses. I love the idea that these are in energies that are around us, that are available to us. They're attendant to us as we need them. And we can call on them purposefully to assist at any part along the way. But I want to finish with the idea of Calliope, which is the call to your great work. Calliope is the voice of the call, the heroic voice. Her voice rises above the clamor and signals awakening that is about to become transforming. And I, I like the what we were talking about moments ago is being able to perceive the signal from the noise. That when the signal is too quiet and the noise is too great, right, we're in trouble. So we need to have the right ratio for that. And mindfulness, presencing, quieting the mind, withdrawing the senses, going to that state of being connecting with the infinite that we are never separate from is, I believe, the place where we can hear the voice of that call. Is there, in your estimation, a practice that one might be able to consider in the days ahead to be more attendant to the great work that is attempting to be expressed through one as one. Oh my goodness, a practice. There's a lot right. of things 
the practice, but here's a great one. Uh, you know, one of my great pleasures is filmmaking. Yes. For a ton of reasons, which is a whole nother podcast. But um, wait, did you just suggest we could have another podcast together? Well, let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. So, in filmmaking, we put together stories, and you know, when you walk into a theater or you sit at home and you watch it on the screen, if it's well done, you're lost. You're engaged. You're drawn right into the to the drama of it, to what is going on between these characters. You have empathy, you have insight. Uh, you even fill in the spaces between the, the, the in the silences and between the close-ups. You, you fill in the emotional detail and you're completely lost. You're completely in it. And it's on a screen. We're not aware that it's on a screen. On a screen, it's on a screen. Now, if we can somehow pull back a little bit and remember as we're watching, this is on a screen, and I am also fully, I'm enraptured with the minutia, the moment, day to day to, of my life the emotions and the feelings and the doings, the doings, the doings. I'm not so much aware of the willings, the willingness, the willingness. And I'm processing things mostly through logic and reason. Mostly I'm taking an entire universe of experience and, <laughs> and it only exists up above my eyebrows, mostly. But if I was, God forbid, hit by that truck that <laughs> My worst fear, right, is that my guardian is going to be distracted for one second. I can get what <laughs> But I was hit by that truck and I woke up and I had not one memory. Nothing. There would still be, I, I, normally I would just ask the question, you know, do you think what would be left? And it's in, the, in the interest of, of efficiency and time, I will provide the answer. The only thing that would be left is your awareness, I'm aware. That is the screen upon which everything is projected. That is the screen to go back to the movie metaphor. All that action, the sturm and drang, all that sound and fury, it's on a screen. Every thought, every feeling, every action, every choice, every decision, every attitude, every experience that I have in every way moving through the world, awake or asleep, imagined, remembered, it plays out in my awareness. The awareness is the big game. The big game. When you open to, I want to become more and more relational with the mystery of that. Everything else begins to uh, take on a different flavor and has, and the grip loosens up. The awareness, the awareness. Nice. In the polarity map, there is the inhale, the exhale. And there's a downward spiral to that which is we live our lives with our song unsung. And the upward part of that spiral is the fulfillment of our purpose. So if our great work is to be aware, aware of the purpose, aware that we are the creator, certainly the co-creator of the world, but, but the creator of this life experience that we're having, the big game is to participate actively, not only in the recognition of it, but the choicefulness to make this an artful life of truth, goodness, and beauty, to live forward with a level of willingness and intentionality to do our great work in this universe story. Beautiful. 
Yeah. 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 So as a filmmaker, final thought here, as a filmmaker, is it fair to say like Shakespeare did that we are on the stage of this life? Can we be the producer, the director, the actor simultaneously? Do we have to fragment those out and have a practice to sense, okay, how is this day going to go? What is my choice? No, we have that uh, capacity. We absolutely have that capacity to, and it begins with a sense of knowing intellectually. It's a cognitive function initially. We have a sense that, oh, I'm going to, um, I'm going to do this exercise. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to uh, plan my day. I'm going to, um, I'm going to see where are my set points energetically. Um, I'm going to discover. Um, I'm going to listen to this podcast. I'm going to listen to this podcast. I'm going to write it out ten times. <laughs> Right. You know, and then one, I'm going to learn the ground rules, and then I'm going to learn how to tag to tag into um, uh, certain traditions of whether it is working with muses or or uh, archetypal energies or whatever. It's it's end the the menu is endless. Oh, uh, I'm going to I'm going to do laws of attraction. I'm going to do all this stuff. Going to read Barnett's book. I'm read going to listen to Paul Sheely's <laughs> Paraliminal. Yes. So there is an inter- And I'm going to retrain. Yes. I'm going to retrain my choice making. And I'm going to push my uh, my um, energetic set point up a notch. Yes. I'm going to push it up from, you know, impatience. Or I'm going to push it up from uh, whatever it is up to well-being i may even push it up to optimism i may even push it up to excitement i may even push it up to hope i may even push it up to passion oh my god and if i learn how to if i learn how to stay there yes the choices and the decisions that i make and what i allow myself to be open to uh, are a very, very different experience than when mm-hmm. I, if I'm operating at the, um, the, the, on the right side of the piano, or is it the left side of the piano? I don't play the piano. So you can, we can do that. We can absolutely do that. And that is um, important. Simultaneous with that, we begin to uh, become aware that uh, these uh, strategies, I learn how to drive, I learn how to drive my psychological state up into a post-psychological state. I learn how to move from one paradigm of being the hero's journey to a post-heroic journey. There's no heroes, there's no... These are other templates of being and and we begin to experiment with that and then simultaneously it's not a line it's all happening at once simultaneously we become aware that all of these things are being played out on the screen of my awareness and my awareness is outside time it's outside space i don't know what it is i don't I can't even find myself in it. It appears like it's coming through a center, but I don't appear to have a head in it. So I'm not even in it. I'm not in my consciousness because I am my consciousness. And it begins to um, deconstruct. We begin to allow ourselves to become deconstructed by the experience of becoming close and tender with a mystery that resolves subject, object. At the same time as we are playing subject and object, it is complicated. That doesn't mean that it is um, that doesn't mean that it, it is complex. That doesn't mean that it's complicated. It's complex. Yes. It, and and the, the, uh, the articulation of it um, sounds, again, it's like trying to, te- to, to 
tell somebody how to drive their car. It's intuitive. It is. It sounds complex because we have fragmented ourselves going all the way back to these origin stories that we talked about earlier. We have yeah. distanced ourselves uh, from a non-dual experience. And this is the Humpty Dumpty story. I am. I love and all the king's men. <laughs> yes. You know, you know, you don't, there's nothing you can do to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, but the experience of the uh, state that is whole was always whole, will always be whole, can only be whole, that supersedes and holds the capacity for us to wander off inside of it, pretending <laughs> to having a, a, an interesting dream, series of dreams inside of it. That place puts us back together again. What is beyond that? Well, you know, again, if you're in certain traditions in the East, uh, that is pretty much the end of the reincarnational cycle of trying to put <laughs> Humpty Dumpty back together again. Not because it's a reward, because, but because, well, what's the point? I got the game. I got the game. And we're all winners in the end. But while you're playing the game, if you know you're going to win, there's no fun in playing the game. Mm. You got to get right up to the edge. Woo, 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 woo. And then you play the game over and over and over again. But if you know you're going to win, once you know you're going to win, once you know the game, once you know all the world's a stage and you are every single player, game's over. Have, have fun. Have fun. Yes, that is what that will be my parting word to our listeners. Remember the love. I love it. Bernard? Super, super fun. Love, love, love you. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Love you, man. Great to be with you. Peace and blessings. Be well. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Barnett Bain. You can learn more about Barnett at barnettbain.com. That's B-A-R-N-E-T. B-A-I-N dot com. And now in the second part of the podcast, it's just you and me. I'll tell you how to use the paraliminal sessions in the Mind Tracks app to easily handle obstacles and move toward the success you want, especially as it relates to our conversation with Barnett. If you're new to the relaxing paraliminal audio sessions, they use breakthrough technologies to activate your whole mind in only 20 minutes to help improve any area of your life. Let's get going. Welcome to the follow-on session with our conversation with Barnett Bain. Talk about drinking from a deep well. I absolutely love Barnett. He's got some great ideas and I'd like to offer some ways that you can use paraliminal technology to use the information that we discussed today, take it to a level deeper. A big part of what he was saying is how can we embody or really live our role as the creative force in our lives to be able to willingly create a life of meaning and purpose and live into our great work in this lifetime. A lot of very interesting, subtle distinctions. But what I'd like to talk about is the simplicity of it all comes down to a few simple ideas. The first is that our life purpose is really about our conscious awareness of who we are, what we're doing, who we are being on a daily basis. Secondly, it's about having a compassionate relationship with ourselves. So we are our own best support mechanisms as we are on the heroic journey of our life to create a life of meaning and purpose. And finally, the idea of, well, actually the next is about living 
to your life's purpose, really living up to the fuller expression of what he refers to as the great work of our lives. And finally, is the idea of being intentional about our daily transitions, that it's as we move from one task to the next, to be exquisitely aware of that means that we really bring the full attention, our, the presence of who we are, and more creatively are able to engage the true meaning and power of our lives, but also all the resources that are within us and around us to get where we want to go. So paraliminal on the first concept, which is that our life purpose is connected to being consciously aware. The first paraliminal that occurs to me on this is called the new history generator, where we're actually able to think about the trajectory of our lives from when we were living our first story, as Barnett talks about it, what happened to us that didn't work out very well. And we can look at our lives from three different, um, different trajectories. One is the life that we lived as it was, a life that we wished we could have lived, and one where something unexpected occurs. And in this, we start to recognize the creative potential within us to modify our own personal history, our memory of our history, so that we can recognize we can choose how things go going forward from there. So first story, second story, and then third story, which is what is the narrative of our lives that we would like to live into? So that's a new history generator. The session A is a little different than session B. Session B gives you the opportunity to review this day. Do what Dr. Buckminster Fuller referred to, and, and uh, Barnett was a student of Bucky Fuller as well. But to, to live in a daytight compartment, to have a compassionate view of yourself, having lived, perhaps fallen off track, perhaps failed at some things, but live recognizing that you get a do-over tomorrow. You have an opportunity to get better and better as each day progresses. The second paraliminal that addresses the idea of living with more conscious awareness and purpose is the paraliminal conscious time where you really recognize that today you get to decide how you're going to use the time that you have. Can't save time. You can only spend it. So how will you spend it? Will you spend it intentionally, willfully, connected to the resources that are available to you, the sense of optimism, possibility, what will be the container for your choice of how you live this day? The second area is the idea of having a compassionate relationship with yourself. And in this, we have a paraliminal called self-love, where we take that part of us, which was our past, and we take that part of us, which is the future yet to be lived, our inner elder and our inner child or our younger selves, we bring them together with our present self right here and now and be able to have a relationship to the trajectory of our own life story. First story, not only you know the tragedies and limitations that we came in with or the gifts that we may have come in with, but also what we did with that, how we overcame our limitations. And then finally, where are we headed? And when we can have an awareness of the entire arc of our lives, we can be much more purposeful in how we live. Really love the self-love uh, love paraliminal. It builds that compassionate way of being with yourself. 
The third area is the idea of living up to the fullest expression of your life's purpose. And at the end of our conversation, you may remember you talked about overcoming, you know, going from one state to the next, maybe in the highest is passion. And that is the energy of our heart being fully expressed. And the paraliminal called joy really sets us in the context of our living a fully expressed, joyful life this day right here, right now. Great paraliminal. There's another one, gratitude, which is wonderful for whatever happened, but passion and, and the joy paraliminal is one I'd recommend based on our conversation with Barnett. And then the final area is about being intentional about your daily transitions. Now, there is a special time every single day where we transition from wakefulness to sleep and from sleep to wakefulness. The ancient tradition of the Himalayan yoga meditation, there are three distinct states, wakefulness, dream, and sleep. Sleep being other than dreaming. But that's that point. I referred to it in my conversation with Barnett about that withdrawing of the universe back to itself, to that original creative state from which everything emerges. And this ideal paraliminal for Getting in touch with that, developing a capacity for it is the sleep deeply, wake, refreshed, paraliminal. And the listening sessions are designed at those transition points. So as you're going to sleep, listen to sleep deeply. As you're awakening, listen to the wake, refreshed. In both cases, what you're doing is you're creating a bookend to your day, more importantly, is you're managing the, those transition states. And when you get really skilled at transitioning in that way, you're actually going to be able to see how you can transition in all things during the day. So you're getting ready for a meeting. How you step out of whatever you're doing and step into a state in which you're going to be most effective at the meeting. Or you're coming home from work and you're going to join your family. What's that transition going to be like? How intentional will you be? Will you carry your business day with you or you, will you leave it behind? If you have some homework to do, that's fine to work on it. But be mindful of how you transition from one state to the next. The more mindful you are, the more intentional you are, the more purposeful you can be. You're developing your conscious awareness. And as Barnett says, all there is, is consciousness. And consciousness is the original creator of all that you experience in this day. Now, it is a deep well to drink from if you try to follow that one all the way to the end. It's more than what we could get into in our brief, <laughs> yes, it was brief, our brief conversation with Barnett. I, I'll tell you, it is wonderful to be with him. I hope you get a chance to watch some of his movies. I hope you get a chance to read some of his books. Great thinker, wonderful person, and it was my joy to bring him to you. Peace and blessings. That's all for now. Thank you for joining me today. I applaud your willingness to maximize your potential. You can easily use the Paraliminal Audio Sessions and the MindTracks app to stimulate your non-conscious mind, that is your inner mind, to reduce any resistance in your life and to propel you toward the success you want. Visit MindTracks.com to learn more. These amazing audio tools have helped millions and I encourage you to bring them into your world today. Be sure to be back for more episodes of the Mind Tracks podcast. 
You'll find insightful conversations with authors, experts, and thought leaders, all devoted to improving your life's experience. Thank you again for being here on our Mind Tracks podcast.